Professor Pemberton. In this video, we're going to talk about inverse functions. So the first few things we're going to talk about in this video is how do you verify that two functions are inverses with one another? And then in the next video, we'll talk about how to find the inverse of a function, how to use the horizontal line test to determine whether a graph represents a function will have an inverse or not, how to find the inverse graph given a graph of a function that will have an inverse, and then find the inverse of a function and graph both functions in the same axes. So let's start by talking about what does inverse functions actually mean. So we talked about in the last couple of videos on how to find new functions when you're given two functions using operations. Well, let's say you have a function f, and the function f is a set of ordered pairs. If you remember, it's just a all the ordered pairs that satisfies the equation or the function. Well, it turns out that you can undo what the function f does by reversing each of the components in the ordered pair. What that means is that if you have an x that you plug into the function f, you'll get exactly one y value because it's a function. Well, if you have an inverse function, the inverse will undo what the function f did. So it will take a y value as an input and it will send the y value back to where it was. It was back to x. So this is a resulting relation. It'll be a set of ordered pairs again, where you have y comma x instead. Okay, if you reverse the x's and the y's, keep in mind that every input has to have exactly one output. Well, that may not be the case every single time. So in this section, we're going to develop ideas on how to study functions whose compositions have a very special undoing relationship. So here's an example of inverse functions. These two functions are describing the relationship between a price of a computer, again, just like the last video. You have one function that is taking the price of the laptop or computer and subtracting $300. And then you have another function that's taking the price of the laptop and adding $300. So the function f takes $300 away from the computer's price, but the function g will add $300 to the computer's price. We're going to find out what happens when you form the composite function f composed with g. So this is a good review of what we talked about in the last video. We're going to find out what is f when you compose it with g of x. And if you remember the definition from the last video, it's f of g of x, where g is the inside function and f is the outside function. Well, to find this function, this new composite function, you take the function g of x, which is x plus 300, and you substitute it into the outside function, which in this case is f. So let's see what happens. If you take this x as an input in f and replace it with x plus 300, so you have x plus 300 for this x, then subtract 300. Well, it turns out that 300s will just undo each other. One is adding 300, the other one's subtracting 300, and you just get x back. So in other words, whatever the function g does to the original price, well, the original price was x, you add 300 to get the y value for g of x, well then the function f just undoes it. It just takes the price and subtracts the $300 that you already added. And so you get the original price of the laptop back. Let's see what happens if you do the other composite function. So if you reverse the order and you put g on the outside and f is on the inside, we noticed in the previous video that this is not necessarily going to be the same function. So this time it's g composed with f of x. g is the outside, and f of x is replaced with x minus 300 as the inside function. Well, you'll come up with x minus 300, and then you need to add 300, just like the function g says to do. Well, again, notice that the minus 300 will cancel out with the plus 300, and so you just get x back. So it doesn't matter which composition you do, f composed with g or g composed with f, you just get the original x back as the output from both functions. And notice that the answers are the same when you do composition. This is a very rare circumstance. When you reverse the order, the composite functions are going to be equal. So therefore, When we calculate the 
both discounts. in either order. We always obtain the original price. And that's what we found out. So if you did G of F of X, or if you did F of G of X, and you do the composition, you just get the original price of the laptop back. So in other words, F composed with G of X is equal to G composed with F of X. So it doesn't matter which order you do the composition, in this case, it turned out to be X either way. So in other words, the final price of the computer remained the same. So if you do both functions, you start off with X dollars for the computer, it turned out that both functions gave you X dollars as the output. Well, in general, if you make changes made by x by a function that are undone by another function, then you have what's called an inverse function. So under these conditions, we say that the function, each function, is an inverse function of one another. So in this case, there's a notation for inverse function. So the fact that this function g of x undid the function f, or vice versa, f undid the function g, g is an inverse function of f. And it's expressed this way. You have the function's name can be rewritten as g of x is equal to, and this is read as, f inverse. Don't think of this as an exponent, okay? f, and the superscript is negative 1, means the inverse function of f. So that means g is the inverse function of f. So with these ideas in mind, we're going to come up with the formal definition of an inverse of a function. Okay, so this is the definition of an inverse of a function. You have two functions, f of x and g of x, and they satisfy the property that we were just talking about. If you do composite functions, in either order, f of g of x or g of f of x, and you just get x in either case. It has to be x for every single x value in the domain of g, or every single x value in the domain of f, then these two functions are inverses of each other. So the function g is the inverse function of f. If you have an inverse, there's only going to be one of them. And it's denoted f inverse. So f superscript negative one is f inverse. And that means you can rewrite these conditions. f on the outside, g of x is replaced with f inverse, so it's f of f inverse of x will just give you x. And the second condition can be rewritten as f inverse on the outside and f of x on the inside, and you should just get x still. Now, one very important property that we're going to find out very quickly is that the domain of f is the range of the inverse. Now, that's going back to the idea behind you are reversing the x's and the y's. You plug in x's into the function f, and you get y values. If you plug in y values into the inverse, you will go back to x values. So let's talk about this in terms of an arrow diagram. So in other words, the function f takes x values to y. So this x value is plugged into the function f, and it sends it to a y value. So this is the domain of f, because these are all the x values that you can plug into the function f, and this is the range of f of x, all the y values. Well, now let's think about the inverse function. The inverse function undoes what the function f did. Well, it's going to take in a y value as an input. The set of all input values are the domain. So the range of f is the domain of the inverse function. So the domain of f inverse of x so this y value is plugged into the inverse function, and it's sent back to the x value. So the domain of f of x is also the range of the inverse. So the range of f inverse of x is the domain of f of x. And so this x value is x equals f inverse of f of x, or it can be written as f inverse of 
f of x. So that means you plug x into f first, you get your y value, and that y value is plugged into the inverse second, and you should just get the original x value back. And that's what this error diagram is showing. Your x goes to a y, the inverse function sends the y back to x. So after both functions, doing the composite function, you should just get the original x back. So the property that we just found out is that the domain of f is the range of the inverse function, f inverse, and the range of f is equal to the domain of the inverse function of f. So let's talk about example one. This is an example that we talked about in the first section of the course. We have a set of ordered pairs and it's describing a relation that is also a function. Every single x value is sent to a unique y value. So in this problem, they're asking us to find the inverse relation of the function. So if this function is called f of x, let's find the inverse relation first. Then we'll talk about domain and range. So if you have a set of order pairs, the inverse relation will also be a set of order pairs. It's where all the x values are now the y values. All the output values are now the input values. So negative 3, negative 27 becomes negative 27 comma negative 3. Same thing for the negative 2, negative 8. It becomes negative 8, negative 2. Negative 1, negative 1 stays negative 1, negative 1. 0, 0 stays. 1, 1 stays. But then the last two become 8 comma 2 instead of 2 comma 8. And 27 comma 3 instead of 3 comma 27. Notice that all the x values become the outputs for the inverse, and all the outputs become the inputs for the inverse. Okay, so now let's talk about the domain. State the domain and range of the function and the inverse relation. Explain your reasoning whether the inverse relation is a function or not. So let's talk about the domain. Domain of f. So what values would be in the domain of f? Well, it's all the set of input values. So f was input negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and 3. It's all the x values from the original function. Well, if you notice, these same values are now the output values for the inverse. So this becomes the range of f inverse. Okay, just like we saw before with the arrow diagram. And now let's find out what the range is. The range of f is the set of all output values or set of all y values from the original relation. So negative 27 was an output, negative 8, negative 1, 0, 1, 8, and 27. But again, notice that these values are also the input values for the inverse. So this is the domain of the inverse function. So this is a property involving the original function and the inverse. Domain of f is always going to be the range of the inverse function, and the range of f will always be the domain of the inverse function, always. So let's go back to something that's asked at the very end. Explain whether the inverse relation is a function. Well, look at all the input values. Every single input value is used, and every single input value is corresponding to exactly one output value. So negative 27 only goes to negative 3. Negative 8 only goes to negative 2. Negative 1 only goes to negative 1, and so on and so on. So the inverse relation actually is an inverse function. All right, something else that we've learned already about the definition of inverse functions is that you have a way of checking your answer of whether two functions are inverses of each other. So example two is saying, show that these two functions are inverses of one another. And if you go back to the definition, the way to check this, check to see if these functions are inverses of one another by calculating the composite function.
It doesn't matter which composite function you find, you should just get the same answer either way, if you go back and look at the definition, but either way, you should get the original x value. So let's try one of these out. We're actually going to do both, but you only have to check one of them. So let's try the composite function where f is the inside function and the inverse is the outside function. So this would be f inverse of f of x, which means you're taking the in inside function f of x and plugging it into the inverse function. So you're plugging in 3x plus 2 into the inverse function. We're going to plug in for this x. So you have 3x plus 2, then subtract 2, and then you divide by 3. So one thing that you should be paying attention to is the operations are going to undo each other when you simplify. So plus 2, subtract 2, undo each other first. And now you have 3x divided by x. And now you have 3 times x, and it's also divided by 3. So multiplication by 3 and division by 3 undo each other, and you should just get x back. So that's important. If you do composition of a function with its inverse, you should only get x. So this shows that these two functions are inverses of one another. Okay, But we're going to show it with the other composition just to be safe. So if you do f on the outside and the inverse on the inside, so you'll have f of f inverse of x. This time we're going to take the inverse function and plug it into the outside function f. So take x minus 2 divided by 3 and plug it into f for the x. So 3 times x minus 2 divided by 3 and then you need to add 2. So again notice that the operations will undo each other. This time you have to undo the multiplication and division. So multiply by 3, division by 3, undo each other. And so you have x subtract 2 and then you have plus 2. Well, they undo each other. Minus 2 plus 2 is also just x. So it doesn't matter which composition you do. You should just get x either way. And if you do, then you can say this. Therefore, f of x and g of x are inverse functions of one another. And so the last thing we're going to look at in this first video is how did these two operations undo each other? How can you find the inverse function if it's not given? That's where we're heading. So on one hand, you have f of x is 3x plus 2 from this previous example. And on the other hand, we had f inverse of x was x subtract 2 divided by 3. So this diagram is illustrating how do the operations undo each other. Well, if you are doing f of x first as the inside function, the first operation that you would do with x would be multiplication by 3. So you would take x and multiply by 3. So that would take this x value and send it to 3 times x. That's the first operation. Then the second operation is you take 3x and you add 2. So add 2 to 3x. And that would take 3x and send it to 3x plus 2. So now let's look at the inverse function. The inverse function, what do you do with x first? Well, you subtract 2 first. So subtract 2. And then the second operation is you divide by 3. So divide x minus 2 by 3. So going backwards, the inverse function would take subtraction by 2 first. That should undo the addition. So notice that the addition was done second with the function f, but the subtraction is done first with the inverse function. So we get to subtract 2 first to get back to 3x. So now how do you undo the multiplication by 3? The second operation was to divide by 3. So to get back to the original x, divide by 3, and now you're back to x. So this gives you an idea of how do the operations undo each other and in what order. 
f of x, you multiply and then you add. The inverse function, you undo adding first, so subtract, and then you undo multiplication second, which is division. Okay, and then there's one more note that I want to make, is that you should notice that the inverse function was x subtract 2 divided by 3, that is not equal to 1 divided by f of x. Okay, which is 1 divided by 3x plus 2. So in other words, this negative 1 does not mean reciprocal. Okay, it's not an exponent. The inverse function was you had to undo the operations in a certain order. This is not undoing any of the operations that f of x does. So such that negative 1 is not an exponent on f of x. So f inverse is correct as x minus 2 divided by 3, and it's not equal to 1 divided by 3x plus 2. That's not correct. So if you have a function, you cannot just take the reciprocal and find the inverse. Okay, you have to think about how do you undo the operations. So this is a good place to stop our first video. If you have any questions about any of the examples in this video, please let me know. Or if you have any questions while you work on the homework, please let me know that as well. And I'll see you at the next video when we talk about how to find an inverse function, how to use a horizontal line test to determine whether a graph has an inverse function, and how to graph inverse functions.